Today, I want to talk about why we should pay attention to breathing, why we might need to train breathing as movement practitioners. So we breathe um, in order to take in oxygen to get rid of carbon dioxide. This is part of the process of how our body generates energy. Now, when oxygen is involved, that is known as aerobic respiration. Uh, and basically, the role of oxygen is, is a chemical used in the break to break down glucose in order to make energy. Um, so it's used in the chemical reaction that creates the energy that gets delivered to the cells. And the waste product of that chemical reaction is carbon dioxide. Now, uh, it's not essential. We don't necessarily need oxygen in order to create energy. We can do this also uh, by substituting more glucose in that is known as anaerobic respiration. Uh, but this is a little less healthy for the body. It basically produces more toxins to the body. So uh, it's not quite as sustainable as using oxygen. Uh, so we know breathing's important but let's take a look at how important it can actually be. So if we take um, three examples of uh, what we need in order to maintain the body and produce energy, we need oxygen, we need water, and uh, we need food. Uh, I've got in brackets there, glucose, we need glucose for the energy, but also over the long term, we are gonna need all the extra nutrients that are associated with that. Um, now, in terms of water and food, our bodies are actually have systems where they can store that. They're pretty good at storing all the so glucose, or st they'll store it as food as fat. They will store water in all the cells. In fact, they need to store, our bodies need to store water in the cells in order to stop them uh, dying out. Um, and this is sort of represented, if we look uh, at these three, how long we can survive without each. Uh, that's coming up on the right there. Uh, in terms of food, we can go for weeks, maybe even months, uh, just running on our reserves, the glucose that we've stored in our body. With water, it's not quite as long. Um, at best, we can probably go days. Uh, when With oxygen, though, it's a different story. So we can only last minutes without it. Um, it said, normally it said that after about four minutes, that's when we start to see permanent brain damage happening, which uh, obviously really isn't great. Now, we know that it's not always uh, four minutes. Uh, the world record for holding your breath underwater is now, I believe it's about 24 minutes and free divers routinely break the limit of four minutes. So with some training, we know that we can teach the brain not to cause irreversible damage, but nevertheless, even if you're highly trained, the margin is much uh, quicker with, than with water or with food for how long you can survive without oxygen. Now that's probably due to the fact that we've got oxygen in the air all around us. Our brain doesn't need to be storing it in the same way as it might with food or water where uh, we can go without that for much longer. So I think that's a pretty good argument as to uh, why we need to breathe. But obviously this is talking about something more. So this is uh, why should we actually train our breathing? Um, if we think about it, surely that's something we should be good at anyway. Our body adapts to survive. Uh, you would think that it has adapted breathing so that we just do it naturally in the best way anyway. Um, and that's true, it has, but it's also important to remember that our priorities as far as our bodies are concerned are not necessarily the same as our own priorities. Um, so if you think about it, our brain's primary job is survival. Um, it does whatever it can to make us survive for as long as it needs us to. Um, 
And the way that it does that is in a much more risk averse way. It takes a much more risk averse approach than, than we might. Its goal is to conserve as much energy as it possibly can at all times in case it needs it for a later date. Um, the main goal of the brain really is just find out where is the danger and how do I get away from it? Now the conservation of energy thing makes sense. So uh, you don't know where the next dangerous thing is coming from. There could be danger all over everywhere. Um, so you don't wanna waste all of your energy dealing with one task just in case something else uh, comes up. Uh, so that's kind of how it works. The next thing that we need to uh, talk about is what happens when we go into panic mode. So when our brain thinks we're in danger, it forces us to breathe in a very different way. So the first thing it's gonna do is it focuses more on the inhale than the exhale. So it wants us to get as much oxygen in because it needs oxygen right now. It's less worried about the exhale where we're getting, getting rid of the carbon dioxide. Carbon, carbon dioxide is gonna be toxic uh, over time, but again, it's less worried about long-term danger. It's more worried about how am I going to make sure I've got enough energy? How can I keep all these chemical reactions that are required to produce the energy at one time? Uh, next, it's going to switch from breathing through our nose, which is really useful because it can uh, warm the air up. There's also lots of little hairs inside our nose that will uh, clean, clean it out so it, they catch the toxins that are coming in uh, and it switches to breathing through our mouth. So if we breathe through our mouth, it's a much wider space. We can take in the air much more quickly. Finally, uh, it changes the anatomy slightly. So if we want to take a really full uh, breath, our diaphragm wants to expand out. So we'll see the breath starting from our belly and then eventually it will move into the shoulders. Um, that's how we can get the most air in at once. But if we just want to keep cycling air through very, very quickly, actually, we're just going to jump straight into the shoulders so we can use our shoulders um, to take in air much more quickly, even if it's not uh, as much as we were able to before. Um, so all of these are just ways that we use to take in more air. And that's what our brain will do when we are in danger or when we're doing something that says, oh, actually, I need more air than I thought I was going to right now. So that could be anything from running away from danger, uh, any kind of physical exercise where we're using large muscle groups, and that could be running away, or it could just be your workout. So using all the large muscle groups instead of the smaller muscle groups is going to take more energy. Uh, alternatively, it could be doing something more complex. So rather than using the large muscle groups, we could be instead you, engaging in a more dexterous task. So something that requires very fine and precise movements um, is going to take more energy to make sure that we get it right. Uh, your body has to use a part of the brain called the cerebellum, which has more than half of the neurons in your brain in order to negotiate that. And that's gonna take a lot of energy as well. Uh, and then finally, it doesn't even necessarily have to be something physical. So if you have to think more, if uh, your thoughts are taking over and uh, you're having to think faster or in a more complex way or even just a different way than you normally do, then your body's gonna take note of that and that is gonna require more air as well. So across all those three things, you can see that probably quite often your brain is gonna find itself in that sort of danger mode where it feels like, oh, maybe I actually need a little bit more air here. Uh, I'm going to change the way you breathe so that I can uh, maximize my short term survival. And then afterwards, I'll go back to normal. So uh, once the danger is through, we go back to, to breathing normally. Uh, and that's how we would normally expect it to happen. But obviously, if we're talking about conserving energy, 
our brain has to devote energy to switching between these two modes as well. So if you find that actually you're in the fight or flight mode, the survival mode quite often, then your brain's going to start thinking, all right, well, maybe some of some of these things, maybe breathing through my mouth, maybe not using my whole anatomy, maybe not exhaling fully, maybe all these things I don't need to change so often. So actually you will start to form a habit of not changing, not changing back into your regular sort of rest and digest breathing mode. Uh, and that's a little bit more common than you think. So if you just do this often, if it happens all the time, then you can ex expect that your body will adapt to it, much like how your body will adapt to uh, your posture. When you sit with bad posture for a long time, your body doesn't try to fight it anymore. It just says, you know what, this is the position you like to be in. Uh, this is how we're, how we're going to be. Um, so our brain begins to habituate this. Um, that can have negative connotations for a number of reasons. So uh, first of all, as we discussed with carbon dioxide, you're not getting rid of as much carbon dioxide as you were before. So the carbon dioxide is going to become acidic in your body. Uh, our bodies really don't like acid. They don't do well in, a, in an acidic environment. So we're going to increase the number of toxins in our bloodstream. Uh, it can affect our sleep habits. So just in because of the anatomy of our vocal cords and all the breathing apparatus, actually breathing through our mouth isn't so great when we are lying down. It's a little harder. So uh, we can develop what's known as sleep apnea. And then that disrupts your sleep. That means you're not breathing so well th throughout your sleep. That's going to be a problem because we need sleep to get rid of uh, all the other toxins and all the other waste products, as well as forming memories and lots of other things. Uh, next thing it can cause is dehydration. So uh, if you imagine the same way as an air conditioner works, blows uh, air out onto water uh, to have a, cause a cooling effect, breathing all the time through your mouth is just going to dry out your throat. You're going to feel like you, you need water a lot more often. Similar to, similarly to if you're talking a lot where the air has to come out uh, through your throat, uh, you're going to find that you need to drink more often than if you were not. Um, then the final thing, this is where it becomes a big problem, is that we get this sort of never-ending uh, feedback loop. So, uh, poor breathing is going to have a knock-on effect to the rest of your brain, which might then in turn cause more poor breathing habits. Uh, so the reason for that is uh, this little red thing here is your medulla oblongata. It's right at the top of the spinal cord. Uh, that's one of the most primitive parts of your brain that there is. And that's where a lot of breathing actually happens. So uh, the majority of breathing happens there. And that's because it doesn't it's so important that it doesn't want the rest of the brain to have to weigh in on every single decision. Uh, now, the problem with this is if you start breathing poorly, that's uh, you're, you're breathing in a way that suggests you're under threat. Uh, and like we've discussed, you've made this a habit now. Well, all the other brain areas are going to take that feedback. And when they make a decision, they say, all right, let's take a look at what's going on, what's the information that's coming in. Uh, they say, oh, the breathing is uh, short and shallow or it's, um, it's through the mouth. It's, it's all the things I would associate with being in danger. Well, that means I must be in danger. And it makes the assumption that the reason you're breathing like that is because you're in danger, even if you're not. So if actually you're breathing like that because you have just learned to habituate it, your body just assumes actually it's because you're in danger. Now, that has more knock-on effects to the ones that we just looked at. So additionally, as well as um, the dehydration and the poor sleeping habits and uh, increased toxins, uh, now we're going to have increased st stress levels. So again, that's more toxins into your bloodstream, but that means we're more likely to be in this fight or flight mode. So uh, 
kind of more erratic movements or body's going to stiffen up, tense, tense up a little bit, or immune systems don't work so well. Uh, we're going to have negative emotions. So if we're in danger, our body produces negative emotions to try and encourage us to change what we're doing. Uh, next, we're going to have fatigue. So if, uh, especially if the increased stress levels isn't working out or it's lasting a long time, it's going to make us tired more often, uh, coupled with the fact that we're not already sleeping as well. Uh, that's really not great. And then finally, we've got decreased pain tolerance. So our bodies will probably, uh, make it more likely for us to be in pain, just like with the emotions. It's a way, a good way to make us change our behavior. Um, so all of those things, when we're breathing in this uh, fight or flight mode, um, show the knock-on effects on the body are really not great. And similarly, if we were breathing in a way that suggested we weren't in danger, uh, then we kind of get the opposite effect going on. So actually our brain would read from from our breathing pattern that, oh, actually maybe things aren't as bad as we thought. And that has a relaxing effect. And that's why uh, we see breathing exercises a lot of time uh, being prescribed for people with anxiety and things like that. Um, so that's kind of what breathing poorly can do. Now in modern society, it is very unlikely that you haven't adopted at least a little bit of some of these things. So just the way that uh, we live is in kind of constantly high stress environments. Uh, we have per movement habits anyway. So actually, even without being in danger, we're likely not to be using our anatomy as well as we thought we were. Um, lots of stress everywhere, like I already said. Um, and as well as that, because we're social, even if it wasn't the case for us, we tend to mimic behavior of people around us. So this all has a knock on effect. It's very likely that some of these things, if not all of them apply to you. Um, now that is my argument for why I think all of us should probably be training breathing. Now things that we can do to combat this, we can retrain our anatomy so we can teach ourselves how to breathe in a way that is uh, more in line with our kind of rest and, di 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 uh, rest and digest uh, system, or just more in line with a way that's more relaxed and comfortable, as well as teaching ourselves to breathe in ways that uh, fill the lungs completely. So being able to take full breaths and being able to take full exhalations as well to get rid of all the carbon dioxide is uh, probably a really good thing. We can retrain the breathing rhythms. So we breathe uh, much, much quicker when we're in danger. Uh, and our bodies actually have rhythms where when we inhale and when we exhale, normally when we're relaxed, there's a pause. We don't just go from an inhale straight into an exhale. So retraining these rhythms is a good way to um, combat this. Uh, and then finally reducing the breathing rate. So if we can breathe a bit slower, uh, normally people say about eight to 20 breaths a minute is the average for a human. And there's research coming out now uh, saying that maybe we could lower that even more, a little bit more, um, and that can actually have some benefits as well. So doing those three things, we can probably see a lot of positive changes in our whole life, but especially as movement practitioners, we're probably going to find that our brain now is less stressed about something that is very important to it for its survival. And that means we are able to focus more on the more complex things we want to do, such as our movement goals. So there's my thoughts on why I think we should all be training breathing. There are going to be more videos to come uh, with some tips and tutorials on how you can do this. Uh, let me know what you think. So do you train breathing already? Do you already try uh, certain techniques? Uh, and which ones do you find work for you? And stay tuned for more information on breathing. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you next time.